Chapter 23, Foul Play. The mood in the Trolliseum shifted when Jupiter stepped into the arena. The hum of distracted chatter turned to whispers. People actually sat up straighter. One of the Wanderer Society's most celebrated sons had finally taken a candidate. They were dying to see what she had a knack for, this girl who had tempted the great Jupiter North into patronage. Morrigan was also dying, but not from curiosity. She was dying to run, dying to hide, dying to engulf the, um, dying for the arena to floor to explode like an old volcano and engulf the whole place in a wave of molten lava. Her heart was beating out of its cage like it wanted to attack something. Not something, someone. How could Jupiter do this to her? All year long, Morrigan had trusted him, certain that whatever her mysterious knack was, her patron knew about it. He told her not to worry, that he had the whole thing in hand, and now he'd gone and thrown her under a bus. She didn't have a knack. She'd been right all along. Angry tears stung her eyes, threatening to spill over. How could he? May I approach? Jupiter asked the elders. Morrigan knew, having sat through more than 70 of these by now, that this was an odd request, but Elder Quinn waved Jupiter forward. Morrigan stood alone in the centre of the hushed arena as Jupiter spoke quietly with the elders. She looked around at the curious faces in the stands, imagining how they'd laugh when they discovered it was all a joke, that Morrigan Crow of Nevermore had no talent at all. Or maybe they wouldn't laugh. Maybe they'd be angry at Jupiter for wasting their time. Not as angry as me, thought Morrigan. Then Jupiter did something very strange. One by one, he held Elder Quinn, Elder Wong and Elder Saga by their shoulders and pressed his forehead to theirs. They emerged from this odd exchange, blinking and dazed, shielding their eyes and stared at Morrigan for a long time in silent astonishment. And then, Morrigan's name went straight to number one. The Trolliseum erupted. People leapt to their feet, shouting at the elders, demanding an explanation for this madness, demanding to see a knack from Morrigan Crow, the wretched interloper. Morrigan herself was so stunned that she forgot to be mad at Jupiter. She stood frozen, absorbing the deluge of fury. Bellowed accusations of favouritism and cheating echoed in the stadium. Morrigan saw Baz Charlton running down the stands, taking the steps three at a time, shouting incomprehensibly. Everywhere Morrigan looked, people were glaring at her. She scanned the crowd for Hawthorne, wondering if he, was, if he too was angry. Could her friend possibly think her a cheat? Jupiter strode over and took her hand, sweeping her along with him through a door at the back of the arena. Come, Mog, let's leave the stroppy masses to their strop. The green room backstage was blissfully empty. There was a single couch, a tray of sad-looking sandwiches and a jug of pale lemon squash. Here and there on the walls were posters for past troll fights and dragon riding tournaments, inoffensive panpipe music played in the background. The room's lone attendant, a young man in a Trolliseum uniform who appeared to be at least half troll, his knuckles dragged on the floor, offered them the tray as they entered. Sammage, he grunted. No, thank you, said Jupiter. Morrigan shook her head. The half troll got bored and left. Morrigan took a deep breath, clenched her, fists, her hands into fists and was just summoning the right words to express her rage when Jupiter spoke up. I know, I know, I'm sorry. Please, Mog, I'm so sorry. I know how confusing this is. He was all, all remorse, remorseful eyes, appeasing voice and shielding hands. Don't hurt me, don't shoot. But listen, it's about to get even more confusing and there isn't time to explain properly now. But I swear, I swear... When this is all over, I will answer each and every one of your questions in excruciating detail. But I need you to be patient and trust me, even though you might not think I deserve it, just for a little while longer, OK? Morrigan wanted to yell at him, to say, no, no, of course it's not OK. It's the opposite of OK. But she didn't. Instead, she hooked Jupiter's little finger forcefully with her own, looking him dead in the eye. Every question, excruciating deal, detail excruciating detail. Pinky promise? Pinky promise. Seconds later, the doors burst open and the elders swept in, their faces schooled and emotionless, their cloaks billowing behind them. Each wore a golden W pin, a golden W pinned at the throat. How long have you known? demanded Elder Quinn. Obviously since before eventide, but how long before? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? Jupiter held up his hand. Elder Quinn, I understand you're surprised, but surprised? Surprised? 
The tiny old woman seemed to grow three inches as she squared off to Jupiter, pointing her finger in his face. Morrigan felt like cheering her on. You tell him, old lady. Jupiter, Amantia's north. I thought your pa I taught your patron. I taught your patron's patron. I've known you since you were 11 years old, saved you from expulsion on countless occasions. I even recommended you to the League of Explorers, and this is how you repay me. Forgive me, but what difference would it have made? Jupiter ran a hand through his hair, shrinking a little as the older woman paced angrily before him. What could you have done about it? Could you have changed anything? Elder Quinn sputtered and stopped in her tracks. Well, no, of course not, but a bit of warning would have been an idea. I'm an old woman, North. You might have given me a heart attack out there. A heart attack? Morrigan's eyes found Jupiter's. What had he shown the elders that were so shocking? He looked guilty. I'm sorry, Elder Quinn. I just didn't want to do anything that might disrupt the gathering. I didn't know if... I mean, I mean it's not exactly... He trailed off with a helpless shrug. I've never done this before. When did the gathering begin? Asked Elder Wong, staring at Morrigan. Hard to pinpoint, said Jupiter. A year or two ago? Winter of ten, perhaps, or spring of eleven? I've been paying staff in the Crow household for information here and there. Tutors, cleaners, that sort of thing. Trouble is, they're all so superstitious, it's hard to sort out actual wondrous events from silly stories. The cook was convinced Morrigan had killed the gardener by sneezing on him. <laughs> Ridiculous. Were there others? asked Elder Quinn. Others? Jupiter looked at her in surprise. She raised an eyebrow. You know exactly what I'm asking you, North. Right, others. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> yes, uh, three others registered. And they didn't show any signs. Jupiter said resolutely, not worth pursuing. Morrigan frowned. Three others registered? Was he talking about the three other children on the cursed children's register? Had he saved her and left them to the hunt of smoke and shadow because they were not worth pursuing? She didn't want to believe that. And aside from your superstitious household spies, North, said Elder Wong, any hard evidence? According to the Winter Sea News Network, wonder shortages in Southlight and Far East Sang began around 18 months ago. Yet, from winter of 10 through winter of 11, Morrigan's hometown experienced record highs in wonder at destiny and remained untouched by the Republic's energy crisis. Until eventide, that is, when wonder readings in Jackalfax showed a sudden drop. He paused, his eyes flicking over to Morrigan. Eventide night, to be precise, around nine o'clock. When you saved my life, thought Morrigan. When we escaped Jackalfax through the sky face clock. What did wonder shortages have to do with her? How in heaven's name did you get her into the free state? Asked Elder Quinn and then changed her mind. Wait, forget it. I don't want to know. I'm sure it's something illegal. Jupiter pursed his lips and breathed heavily through his nose. I'm sorry I didn't tell you, Elder Quinn. Truly I am. Like I said, I was scared to do anything that might disturb the gathering. I know it's stupid. I know it makes me just as silly and superstitious as Crow's kitchen staff, but I worried that if I spoke of it aloud, I might scare it off. Well, perhaps that might have been for the best, muttered Elder Saga, the great shaggy bull. Elder Quinn cut him off with a sharp look. Morrigan had to literally bite her own tongue to hold back the thousand questions that had been burning inside her since this conversation began. So I didn't tell a soul. Jupiter looked at the ground. Not even Morrigan. The elders went silent. Elder Quinn looked horrified, turning from Jupiter to Morrigan and back again. You cannot mean... Do you, are you saying that the child doesn't even know? Really, North, this is unacceptable. Entirely against society rules, huffed Elder, elder Saga. To enter a child into the trials without her knowing why... Unheard of. If your patron were here, what about a safeguard pact? Elder One interrupted. We've just allowed a dangerous entity into the society and nobody's thought to inquire about a safeguard. I'm not dangerous, Morrigan objected with a tiny voice in the back of her head, while a tiny voice in the back of her head said, yes, you are. You're cursed. Was that what the elders were talking about? Jupiter had told her all those months ago that she wasn't cursed, that she'd never been cursed. Had that been a lie too? Oh, this is absurd. Gregoria, Alioth, are we insane? What have we done? 
Elder Wong threw up his hands. There isn't a citizen in the entire realm who would sign such a pact, let alone three reputable, upstanding... Three, boomed Elder Saga. Heavens no. A three signatory safeguard would be fine were the child merely a conjurer of hurricanes or a mesmerist or some ordinary dangerous entity. For this, I suggest five signatories. Dangerous entity? Morrigan wished they'd stop saying that. Nine, said Elder Quinn. Saga and Wong looked at her in surprise. And that's non-negotiable. Captain North, we cannot accept fewer than nine signatories. Not for a... She cut herself off, shooting Morrigan a fretful glance. Not for this. We might as well take her name off the leadership board for now, said Elder Wong. We'll never get, he'll never get nine. I have seven so far. The elders looked taken aback. Jupiter retrieved a scroll of paper from his coat and handed it over. Morrigan tried to catch a glimpse, but he was too fast. Elder Quinn raised an eyebrow as she examined the scroll. Senator Silverback? Queen Cal? You do have friends in high places, and they don't know... They know enough to be sufficiently warned, said Jupiter. Morrigan thought she detected a tiny amount of doubt creeping into his voice, but no, nothing specific. But they have met the child. They will, Jupiter assured her. Soon, I promise. They certainly trust you. And they appear to be qualified, at least, said Elder Quinn, trailing her finger down the list. Qualified for what? asked Morrigan, unable to keep quiet any longer. But if any of the adults heard her, they paid no attention. Elder Saga turned to Jupiter. None of this matters, North, if you cannot find an eighth and ninth signatory. Jupiter sighed and rubbed the back of his neck. I'm trying, believe me. That's why I was late to the trials today. I thought I had an eighth, but it fell through. If I could just have a few more days. I will sign the pact, said Elder Quinn. The other elders looked at her with alarm. It's not against the rules. This is highly unusual, Gregoria, said Elder Wong. Are you certain? Quite certain. She pulled a pen from the folds of her cloak and signed her name briskly at the bottom of the scroll. At least someone on this list will know that what they're getting themselves into. Send me the paperwork this evening, North. Jupiter was momentarily silent, his mouth hanging open in shock. I... I, I thank you, Elder Quinn. Really, thank you. I promise you won't regret it. Elder Quinn sighed deeply. I doubt that very much, dear. Nevertheless, we shall give you until inauguration day to find your ninth signatory. If you cannot find one, Miss Crow's place in Unit 919 will be forfeit. That's the best I can do. They left the Trolliseum through the labyrinthian halls plastered with old posters and photographs of famous troll fights, Morrigan fighting to keep up with Jupiter's urgent pace. I'm sending you and Jack back to the Decalion with Fenestra Mog, he said three or four steps ahead of her. I've got to get that last signature and I'm running sh out of options. I have one last lead, but it it's a long shot and I need... But you promised to tell me. I know I did and I will, but there they are. I found them. Baz Charlton stomped down the hallway, followed by a flouncing, furious Noel Deveroux, a bored-looking Cadence Blackburn and the smuggest moustache in all of Nevermore, Inspector Flintlock. Behind them at least a dozen browned uniformed of the officers of the stink. Foul play, cried Mr Charlton, pointing at Jupiter and shaking with self-righteous rage. Arrest these people, Inspector. Foul play. What was that, eh? What, do you, what did you do to the elders? Some sort of sorcery? Jupiter tried to push past. Not now, Baz. I don't have time for your blithering. Oh, yes, you do have time for my blithering, said Mr Charlton, moving to block him. You might have hoodwinked the elders, North, but you can't fool me. You two have stolen the rightful place of my candidate, Noel. He pointed fiercely at Morrigan, who was surprised. Last she'd seen, Noel was still in ninth place on the leaderboard. One of the last two candidates must have bumped her off. Morrigan tried not to smile. This little black-eyed beast doesn't belong in the society, and I'll be going straight to the elders to tell her that she's... That she's... Filthy illegal, interrupted Inspector Flintlock, hitching his pants up and huffing out his chest. He looked back at the other officers, making sure he had their full attention. His moment had arrived and he was going to savour it. Smuggled in from the Republic and enjoying unlawful refuge in the den of a criminal element. Jupiter looked pleased. I've never been called a criminal element before. How exciting. Shut it, snapped Flintlock. He pulled a piece of paper from his jacket and held it up for them to see. I have got a warrant here. Now, 
I want to see some hard physical proof that she is who you say she is, that she belongs in the free state and isn't just Republic scum trying to take advantage of our hospitality or worse, spy on us for the winter sea party. Come on, Flinty, this is embarrassing now, Jupiter said impatiently. I told you already, Wondrous Society members are outside your jurisdiction. You could lose your badge for this, mate. That would be true, mate, were it not for the fact that the trials have now ended, said Flintlock, looking extremely pleased with himself. He pulled out a second piece of paper and read from it. You need to brush up on your one law handbook, North. Article 97, Clause H. A winning society candidate is not an official member of the Wondrous Society until receiving his or her golden pin on completion of the unit inauguration ceremony and until that time his or her provisional membership may be revoked without due process if deemed necessary and appropriate by the High Council of Elders. Jupiter shied and shook his head. We've been through this inspector. Article 97 clause F. A child who is participating in the entrance trials for the Wondrous Society shall, for all legal purposes, be considered a member, a member of the Wondrous Society for the duration of said trials, or until he or she is removed from the trial process. Flintlock recited over the top of Jupiter's voice. For the duration of said trials, North, the trials are over. The leaderboard is full. The elders have gone home. And the unit inauguration is weeks away, added Mr Charlton, barely containing his glee. I believe that put your wretched little stowaway well and truly within my jurisdiction, finished Flintlock. His eyes had taken on a manic shine, his moustache quivered. He held out his hand. I'll be seeing those papers now, Captain North. Jupiter had nothing to say. Morrigan could see him weighing his options, counting the surrounding officers, looking for an escape route. The silence stretched and Flintlock kept his hand out, waiting patiently, a triumphant glow lighting up his horrible face. Morrigan slumped against the wall, utterly defeated. She'd come so close, so close, and now it was over. She'd die and not get any of her questions answered. She closed her eyes, waiting to be put in handcuffs and marched away. Here they are, Cadence Blackburn's voice echoed in the hallway. Morrigan crapped open an eye to see her holding out a worn piece of paper with one of the corners ripped off, right underneath Inspector Flintlock's nose. What's this? said Flintlock, confused. What am I looking at? It was an old troll fight poster advertising an epically gory battle between Org of Clawflorgan and Morklock of Hergen Lorklanflot. Org and Rorklot, two spectacularly ugly trolls, were pictured snarling at each other and in colourful fonts the poster promised two for one ales, a dazzling half-time show and free entry to anyone who could prove they had troll blood in them. It's her papers, said Cadence in her low flat voice. See, it says right there, Morrigan Crow is a citizen of the free state. Frorigan, Flintlock shook his head woozily as if trying to dislodge something that was stuck. It, er, uh, what? what? Where does it... Just there, Cadence insisted, not even bothering to point to anything. She sounded bored. It says Morrigan Crow is a citizen of the free state and wasn't smuggled in illegally. So why don't you just get over it so we can all get on with our lives? There's a government seal on it and everything. Baz Charlton snatched the papers from her hand. Let me see that. Noel and Flintlock crowded round him, putting their heads together and squinting at Org and Morklock's pockmarked, drool-soaked faces. Baz frowned, blinking repeatedly. This isn't... these aren't... this is a troll's fight. No, it's not, Cadence said. It's a passport. It's Morrigan Crow's Free State Passport. It's not. It's... it's a troll. It's... 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 it's Morrigan Crow's Free State Passport. He repeated, his eyes glazing over. Everything appears to be in order, said Cadence. Her voice hummed like a beehive. So you'll be on your way then? Everything appears to be in order, echoed Flintlock. So we'll be on our way then. He let the poster float to the ground as he marched down the hall, Baz and Noel following dumbly behind. The Nevermore police force officers hovered uncertainly, completely mystified by this strange turn of events, before obediently trailing after the commanding officer. Cadence turned to Morrigan. You owe me. Why did you help me? Because, Cadence hesitated, because I hate Noel. I don't like you very much either, but I really hate Noel. And also because, 
Her voice grew quiet. You remember me, don't you? You remember me from the chase. You nearly got me kicked out of the trials. And Hallam last night. Do you remember that as well? Morrigan glowered. You pushed me into a pond. It's not something I'm likely to forget. Nobody ever remembers me. Cadence interrupted, speaking in a rush. He, she looked at Morrigan strangely. People forget mesmerists. That's the whole point. But you remembered. She glanced up the hallway. We've got to go. She ran to catch up with her patron and disappeared around a corner before Morrigan could think of what to say. What an odd little girl, said Jupiter, staring after Cadence with a puzzled frown. Who is she? Cadence Blackburn. Morrigan picked up the discarded poster, folded it and put it in her pocket. She is odd, yeah. Hmm. Jupiter shook himself out of his reverie and focused his gaze on Oregon. I said she is odd. Who's odd? Cadence. Who's Cadence? Morrigan sighed. Seriously? Oh, never mind.